Tom's here, who's an internet industry analyst and a project director at Georgetown University's Center for Business and Public Policy. To his right is Gigi Sohn, who is now a leadership and government fellow at the Open Society Foundations and was until very recently a counselor to FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. Uh, then we have um, Mark Jamison, uh, a professor and director of the Public Utility Research Center at the University of Florida. And last but not least, Markham Erickson, a telecommunications attorney and partner at Steptoe and Johnson. So uh, I don't know that we have an official announcement yet from the White House on new agency heads, but it seems certain that there's a lot of change in store at the FCC and the <coughs> FTC. Uh, uh, Dr. Jameson, I'd like to start off with you. What role do you expect the FCC to play in promoting competition policy in the new administration? Well, I think, oh, I'm wow. out. <laughs> My thoughts aren't that big. All right, there we go. <laughs> Well, I think in, the, in thinking about promoting competition, it's important to remember that there are two distinct roles between what we would think of as being an FCC role and a F Federal Trade Commission role. With the FCC, it's all about we have monopolies, we control those monopolies through ex-ante regulation. With the Federal Trade Commission, it's all about has there been anti-competitive conduct. And as I think about protecting competition. I think a lot of that activity then moves to the Federal Trade Commission because once you have competition, that issue of do we control monopolies kind of goes away, at least for a large extent, from the Federal Communications Commission. Gigi, do you have a response? So I want, to, yes, first of all I want to say hi everybody, I'm back. Uh, and to thank Tim, yes, I can speak freely now, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. And I want to thank Tim Lorden for inviting me. Um, I wanted to just ask everybody if you get a chance to read uh, something that uh, Mark actually put out today, very well done, uh, at the AEI website, Tech Policy Daily, because I think it really shines a light. Let's talk about language. You're going to hear a lot on this panel and elsewhere in the next six months or so about restructuring and reforming the FCC. What that really means is that folks want to eliminate the FCC's role in promoting competition and protecting consumers and promoting fast, fair, and open networks. That's what it really means. And I, I think it really is here on this paper, is that there is a desire from some, I don't think the, most of the American people would feel this way, but there is a desire from some to turn the FCC into a spectrum management agency and nothing else. So when you hear the restructuring and reform, your ears should perk up. Secondly, when you hear that the FCC should be more bipartisan, what they're really saying is they need to be more friendly to incumbent network interests. Okay? Tom Wheeler, my former boss, wanted to promote competition, wanted to protect consumers, protect the disabled, promote better public safety, and he became a partisan because of it. So when you hear that the FCC should become more bipartisan, that means that AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, the broadcasters should be getting more of what they want. That's what the word bipartisan means. So that's just a little bit of language. So let me talk a little bit about competition policy. Tom Wheeler's mantra was competition, competition, competition. And we discouraged several big mergers as a result, the Comcast Time Warner merger, uh, the Sprint uh, T-Mobile merger, we didn't actually block them, but there was enough Sturm and Drang that the parties walked away. I think in this coming FCC, and reg regardless or not of whether the reports are true, uh, is going to be, the mantra is going to be consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. And Paul Gallant, who's a very uh, well-recognized and well-thought-of uh, uh, analyst, said today, it's going to be smooth sailing for telco, ISP mergers, and smooth sailing for broadcast mergers. Again, I don't think that's what the American people voted for in this election, but I think that's the reality of what this new FCC is going to be. And yes, the desire is to have the FCC have almost no role, or probably no role at all, in competition policy, but giving it to the DOJ and the FTC instead. And I would say the same for consumer protection. All of it would go to those two agencies uh, who have very different roles, certainly don't have the kind of expertise the FCC has, and again, just engages 
does not engage in, in protective, preventative rules, but only enforcement after the fact. Mark Jamison, do you have a response? Uh, the, the main response would be, if, if, you, if you think the words I use are deceiving you, um, my apologies. Don't, don't mean to do that at all. Uh, you, you can look at things I've, I've written, and you can decide whether they're logical and, and make sense. Um, with regard to the skills of the FCC versus the Federal Trade Commission, or even the Department of Justice, when it comes to competition policy, I think they work very much on the same page as how they analyze them. I've talked with economists and all those different organizations, and they all pretty much work on the same way. The FCC does have a lot more sector expertise. That is certainly true. But when it comes to looking at competition, I, I think they're, that's a very even playing field. Mark, Mark? Well, you know, I think both agencies will have a very important role to play in, in pr protecting and promoting competition. Um, you know, with regard to the FCC, historically the FCC is engaged in, in ex ante regulation sort of in three types of cases. One where there's a market failure uh, that uh, requires regulation uh, because there's not the competition that would obviate the need for the regulations. Uh, secondly, where there is a great public interest in regulating a certain uh, sector because of uh, the importance of the medium or the, uh, the, the uh, what's traveling over the medium. Um, and then third, when limited regulations actually um, obviates and, and serves a role as uh, protecting against actually the need to impose greater uh, government engagement, government regulation. It was 44 years ago this month at the Nixon White House uh, proposed limited regulations over cable companies, saying that the limited regulations that they proposed and that they recommended would obviate the need for greater government regulation and intervention about what content should and shouldn't be carried over cable systems. And so I think an important thing to realize is that you can be a Republican and you can be for regulation if it's in one of those three categories, and there's, there's a long history of, of when that happens. I think that I think this FCC will engage in more analysis to determine where and whether there is market failure and when to engage than perhaps the last administration. But I think that uh, they will in certain cases, and we can get into sort of industries that we think are competitive or not, uh, likely uh, uh, maintain some ex ante regula regulations over those sectors where uh, either uh, it's not the kind of competition we'd like to see or there's a greater public interest or to avoid greater government meddling in that in that sector. Larry, what's your take? Well, thank you. So uh, I'm very glad to be here. I think anything is possible given that uh, we're having a deluge of rain in Silicon Valley, which after several years of no rain whatsoever, so, um, you know, anything can happen. And I don't uh, have any particular insights into what, what will happen. I'm not involved in any of the transition activities. I know what I think um, should happen, and I've been pretty clear about this. Uh, I, I would certainly like to see, uh, particularly the FCC, go back to um, the direction it was heading near the end of the Clinton administration uh, and the strategic plan that was uh, developed under then Chairman Bill Kennard, um, which I think still has a lot of great insights, one of which was the recognition that uh, the convergence of all media onto IP technologies uh, really put into reality the fact that the, the structure of the FCC, and I will, we'll get to the, the actual structure maybe later, but it, it, it was no longer appropriate to separate the bureaus by technologies and specific media that those tech, because that now everybody was going to do video and everybody was going to do data and everybody was going to do voice, and whether it was cable, whether it was satellite, whether it was broadcast, whether it was wired or wireless. Um, and that what really was going to be necessary was an FCC that was more reactive to uh, market failures that were going to happen when all these different new players started to compete with each other. And what Kennard proposed was a structure which said, look, we're going to get rid of as much of the, of the sort of legacy regulation that we can and let the technology, which can move much faster than we can move, uh, let the technology do the regulating as best as possible and that we're here when there are true failures to look for very specific corrections that can be implemented, um, that really should be the, 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 the plan, the strategy for the FCC. I, I think it hasn't been implemented, but I think the reality of how convergence has happened since then, 
bears this out, that, that that really was the right approach. And I hope, I say I don't know what will happen, but I hope we go back to that and, and really give it a serious chance. Can I just say one thing, Lydia, just in response to what Larry said? <clears throat> I probably would agree with the vast majority of what you said, but I think what's really important to know, and I actually printed off Bill Kennard's report, the changes he proposed and the deregulation he proposed was predicated on having competition. Okay, and, and Chairman Wheeler was the same way. He used to have that regulatory seesaw thing that was so annoying, right, where there's more competition, less regulation, less competition, more regulation. The problem is, particularly when it comes to internet access, there's hardly any competition at all. In our last internet access report, we found that 78% of census blocks, they had either none, zero, or one broadband provider that provided broadband internet access at the 25.3 speed that is now the data point for that. That's not competition. So I think everybody would prefer, rather than have top-down monopoly regulation, that we have a competitive market. Better services, lower prices, that's the goal. But we are nowhere near that right now. So I think it's important that, you know, Kennard, he had a whole transition plan too but it was all predicated on there being real competition. And the fact of the matter is, for internet access, broadband internet access, there is not. Ready, could I Go yeah, for offer it. something as well? Okay, just, just in, in that space, there, there are two things that, that trouble me how the FCC has addressed what, uh, what Gigi was talking about. One is deciding what it is that people should have or people should buy. And, and then drawing that line and saying, well, since people aren't buying that and aren't having it, there's this terrible, terrible problem. That, that, I don't think that's a good way to analyze the markets. You should look at what customers are valuing and what they're willing to pay, and then does that cover the cost of providing it? And that tells us where the market is, and then you can look at the structural analysis. That's what I would hope that the FCC would do in trying to understand or think about whether it should be involved in any ex ante regulation. Again, I, just, um, I can defend that, but you can move on. Let's keep going. Um, so I think that's an important point, but, and we can argue about you know, 25.3. I don't really want to argue about 25.3. And, but I, the, one of the interesting things is it's, it's long established sort of in strategic planning from a business standpoint that competition does not just mean direct competition. It also means pressure exerted by buyers, by suppliers, by new entrants, and by alternative forms of the same service. Uh, and from that standpoint, it's, again, from Silicon Valley perspective, we see all kinds of competition in this ecosystem, and it's not just, you know, one-to-one, -one, you competing against me. It's essentially disciplinary pressure being put on by the entire supply chain. Uh, and, and from that standpoint, it's true. There, you know, we don't have as much competition, uh, direct competition, I think, as Kennard would have predicted. Maybe that's because we didn't get rid of enough regulation. Maybe not. doesn't really matter. But the reality is there's tremendous amount of, of disciplinary pressure on everybody, including the access providers. You only have to look at their, their carriage uh, fights to, to, to see that. I so, don't know. Look at your bill and tell me if there's a lot of disciplinary pressure. I can tell you I pay $200 a month, and I live in a competitive market for a triple play. I, I, and I do need to respond to, to Mark's uh, statement about we're not, we're not telling people you have to have 25-3. Okay, we looked. We, did, we actually use our engineers and technicians, and yes, there are not enough of them at the FCC. That is a problem that I hope Congress will solve, uh, to see what it would take for a family of four to be able to use multiple devices. And 25.3 was the bare minimum. In fact, Commissioner Rosenworcel said she wished that the standard was 100, symmetrical. So we actually went on the low side, but it wasn't just picked out of midair as a, you know, you know, government nanny telling you you must have 25.3. It was based on the reality of how people use devices today. And I think most people would argue with you that three up really isn't enough if you're using multiple devices in a household. So we kind of went on the lower side for that. Markham. So I, I think, you know, the, this, the Department of Justice for the last several years, the FCC, uh, has basically taken the position that the market for local broadband access is broken and not competitive. And I think there's a lot of evidence to support that. And I think that having a new administration, a new Department of Justice, a new FCC kick the tires on that is not necessarily a bad thing. 
and whether the 2002, the predicates that were talked about that were started with uh, Chairman Kennard and that Chairman Powell continued, uh, the predictions that there would be intermodal and intramodal competition, whether it's broadband over power lines, satellite internet, wireless internet, wireline internet, uh, whether those have come to fruition because part of the predicate for not having ex ante regulation in that time period was this prediction that you would have intermodal and intr intramodal competition. Uh, one of the reasons that Commissioner Pai objected to the open internet order was he said the FCC never engaged in analysis to determine whether those predictive analyses in 2002 actually remain true today. So if the FCC under a Commissioner Pai or another chairman uh, were to look at the open internet rules and engage in that kind of analysis to determine whether there's the sort of competition that requires some sort of ex ante rule or not, I think we shouldn't shy away from that kind of conversation. I think the conversation will uh, result in a sense that there has to be some ex ante rules because there's, no, there's nothing in the immediate horizon that, that would give us any confidence that there will be that kind of, ex, that kind of competition, that sort of intramodal and intramodal competition in the short term because there are so many barriers for entry for uh, wireline providers to dig up streets and deal with the regulatory hurdles that they have to deal with on the state and local level particularly, uh, but also the cost of video programming is so huge uh, that uh, it, it makes it very difficult for wireline providers uh, to, to decide to build and engage and enter market. So whether we have the kind of competition that lets us avoid the need for ex-ante rules, I think is, is something we shouldn't shy away from that, that analysis. I'd like to turn to another topic, uh, but one that you've already touched on. It seems very likely that the FCC will be restructured. Um, Dr. Jamison, you touched on this in your piece that you published today. Can you give us a little bit of a, a summary of what you proposed and also tell us why you think uh, those changes, how you think they'll impact consumers and the industries the FCC regulates? I didn't give a very uh, complete proposal. I, I simply gave kind of a basic structure of, a, of how I think it might look. The basic idea was to try to elevate the role of technical analysis, um, as, as my, my friend here was talking about. The, can we get more studies of what are the markets really like? Can we get more studies of if we regulate, then what happens? Those, those kind of regulatory impact analysis. More studies of here's what the here's what the how the networks are working, and here's how they could work, and here's where the technology is to try and elevate that kind of work. I think in order to do that, you would have to have a bureau of economics, a bureau of engineering, and and then have the other have other bureaus that, that focus on other different types of topics. Because as as Gigi said, one of the real challenges challenges that the Federal Communications Commission faces today is that it's much, well, she didn't say this as directly, but it's much easier to hire lawyers than it is economists or engineers. And that is a congressional issue because it's, it's not the FCC's fault in that regard. But that type of work needs to be elevated. It needs to be given its own voice. I think the commissioners would be a lot better served and then the public is a lot better served. I mean, we could sing Kumbaya on this one. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely frustrating to try to bring engineers, to try to bring economists into the building. And as a result, we end up relying on, you know, industry-supported, industry-funded uh, techno technological reports and industry-funded economic reports. That's not what you want. We do have an Office of Engineering Technology. I think it's got like a dozen people. It's tiny. We have a chief economist and we have economists in each bureau, but you know, I think if you put them all together, that would also be a dozen people. So I'd be all in favor. We have way too many lawyers, and I say this as a lawyer. Uh, and you can bring a lawyer in like that, and if you have to want to bring in anybody else, even a social scientist or anybody else, it's, it's bureaucracy, you know, bureaucracy, more bureaucracy. So I'd be all in favor if Congress would give, us the, give the FCC, I can't say us anymore, uh, the ability to hire more engineers and economists. But, but I also don't want to lose sight of the, the you know, when I, when I said that there ought to be this rigor in terms of an econometrics analysis, I agree, I, I think that's absolutely right. But the public interest component of, of our communications platforms is something that can't be lost as well. And I think here, President Trump at least has an instinct that there's too much consolidation, right? So in October at Gettysburg, as part of his prepared remarks, 
He said he was opposed to the proposed merger between AT&T and Time Warner Entertainment. He said that it's bad for democracy. Those were his words, quote. He said he would unwind the Comcast-NBCU merger. He would uh, reverse that. Now, whether either of those two things happens or not is not really the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, he believes, uh, you know, we have a president that is probably the first social media president and understands the value of communication. And the one thing you can say about open internet rules is it does serve as sort of a virtual vertical integrator. And so if you are an independent content provider, uh, like a Twitter, uh, and you don't have, you're not vertically integrated with a distribution network, the open internet rules do serve as a virtual vertical integrator that you don't have to find, a cons you don't have to consolidate, you don't have to merge with the, to protect yourself or engage in a partnership to protect yourself. And so, you know, where that ends up in terms of how this administration reacts uh, to that uh, is going to be interesting. And econometrics is part of it, but I think there's a public interest overlay about the value of communications and about what kind of, you know, media landscape you want and how much consolidation you want over things like news and, and, and uh, public uh, 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 participation in the political process that probably transcends the, the pure econometrics uh, of, of this. Larry, what do you think the impact would be of the changes that Dr. Jameson has proposed? Well, I agree, I agree that the, the idea of you know, fewer lawyers, more economists, more technical people, uh, nobody, I guess nobody does disagree with that. Nobody should disagree with that. Um, I'm more interested in, I don't know, again, the feasibility of, of doing this from a variety of reasons. And I think you know, Gigi, having been inside, would appreciate or, or better than I would um, just how badly broken the agency is from a structural standpoint, whether the bureaus and the sort of siloed approach to different technologies, different media, uh, you know, re results in duplicative work and, and, and uh, you know, different standards for different media that actually should be one standard, whatever that standard is. Um, but that's, you know, what I would like to see most is a, a rationalization of the structure of the agency so that it, it can treat uh, internet video, internet voice, internet data uh, as one thing rather than a broadcast version, a satellite version, a cable version, a, a, a wired and a wireless version. And I don't know, I mean, can, can, what? No, I think, look, breaking down the silos is a great idea. You know, Chairman Wheeler thought about doing some restructuring and then he decided, look, I only have three years and there's a lot of policies I want to get adopted. So it's really about prioritizing it. Again, what I fear is that restructuring slash reform means eliminating FCC legal authority to protect consumers and promote competition. That, it cannot be that. Okay, if we want to move the deck chairs around so you know, regulation makes more sense and that we're not you know, regulating infrastructure one way for one industry and another way for another industry, I think we can have a conversation about that. I think it's very interesting, but I just don't want it to land up with you know, the Enforcement Bureau becomes you know, a back, you know, backwater bureau like it was before Chairman Wheeler took over. I mean, and that bureaus get eliminated, uh, bureaus that are necessary. So you know, that, that's what I fear is that this, this desire to restructure turns into a desire to severely shrink uh, and severely limit the power of the agency to protect consumers and promote competition. And, and one thing I, I should add that I should have inserted in my first comments was that the structure of the FCC is determined by the commission itself. And it has to have some type of permission approval, OK, from appropriations in Congress to spend money to do that. So it's not something the president can dictate. The commission actually decides that structure. Gigi, you touched on the question of uh, agency authority and what the FCC can do. Under Chairman Wheeler, the FCC really pushed the ball forward in a discussion of what role it has to play in, uh, in regulating privacy online, uh, broadband privacy. Um, it seems likely that that may change under the next chairman, under this administration. But uh, at the same time, we've heard a lot of discussions here at State of the Net about the need for even more discussions with regard to the role of privacy in everyone's lives and how that intersects with industry interests. How do we find a, a balance here between what industry wants to see, what consumers want to see? Look, I think that when the FCC adopted its broadband privacy rules, it gave a really nice template for what privacy can look like, not only for networks, but also for the edge, which is one of the reasons the edge providers weren't so thrilled with our privacy rules. And in fact, I'm looking at some friends out there from Verizon 
they were pretty supportive because that's the way they behave. It seems that the biggest debate in, with regard to our privacy rules was whether um, web browsing, a person's web browsing should be sensitive information that would require uh, opt-in consent or whether it should be non-sensitive, which would mean opt-out consent. That seemed to be kind of really where it was a bridge too far for a lot of the ISPs. So I would expect, because petitions for reconsideration are pending, it took so long to get our rules into the Federal Register. That's a whole other like, weedy topic I don't want to get into, but it's very frustrating. Uh, I would expect that at a bare minimum, the new majority will roll back the web hosting and make them non-sensitive as opposed to sensitive. You know, doesn't make me happy, but it'd be a heck of a lot better than rolling the whole thing back. I think there are some risks, particularly, again, as I said, Verizon was comfortable where we landed up, but most of the ISPs were pretty comfortable with where we landed up except for that one piece. And I think rolling it back entirely, given how people feel about privacy generally, would not necessarily be a particularly good idea as far as public opinion is concerned. Yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's right, in, at least in the in the one sense that that you know the for better or for worse, for better and for worse, the sort of the, the free content industry that that really drives the internet has been built on an assumption of opt out for web browsing as a way of doing behavioral advertising and marketing. Um, and that really was, I think, from, for me personally, that was the point at which the, the privacy order really went too far. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, there's, a, there's obviously a problem of having two agencies uh, with very different approaches, one a regulatory approach, rather a case-by-case -case approach in the FTC, regulating different parts of the ecosystem. In this case now, with different rules, maybe the rules will be harmonized, but still, even if you harmonize them, it's still two agencies, two different approaches to uh, enforcement. I don't see the need for that. I would like it to be one set of rules enforced by the FTC. Of course, as we heard this morning, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem now with that, at least in terms of this one Ninth Circuit case. Uh, and that may be resolved through litigation, or it may require uh, Congress to, to step in. But uh, barring that, uh, I think the solution is go back to uh, FTC and the, and the FTC's rules and the FTC's approach. Yeah, I think until the Ninth Circuit, we, you know, the, the en banc petition was filed in October. Uh, we should know, I, I would think, fairly soon whether the Ninth Circuit takes on that case and, and whether we see a common carrier exemption that's based on status or based on activity will play a very important role, assuming Congress doesn't pass anything, in a privacy bill in the next six months uh, that, uh, that helps us figure out, you know, where the regulatory line should be drawn. But I tend to agree that it's not very helpful to have totally different sets of rules uh, between two agencies. Uh, it creates uh, regulatory arbitrage. It's confusing for consumers. Uh, and it would be, I think, more optimal to have a, a similar set of rules. I think some of the complaints about what, you know, from some industry about it should be at the FCC or it should be at the FTC, I think there's a little bit of the grass is always greener with the other person's regulator, and it's you know it's not necessarily a walk in the park on either side if you're uh, facing enforcement action. So I think uh, trying to figure out a way to move forward where we don't have those regulatory arbitrage opportunities are good, but until the Ninth Circuit uh, rules, I think it's going to be very difficult to know for certain how to draw the regulatory distinctions. I just want to make two points. Number one is I'd like to see the common carrier exemption repealed. You know that's clearly a source of you know, conflict. It's not necessary. I uh, was never allowed to say this when I was at the FCC, but I don't see any reason why the FTC should also have authority over common carriers. Number two, I, I do need to say why I don't think consumers are confused. I don't think anybody thinks about, oh my goodness, my rules, you know, I'm being protected more through my ISP than through the edge providers, and that's a really bad thing, and I'm so confused. I mean, again, I think what would have been nice was to raise the bar, okay, as opposed to lower the bar. And that's something that Congress could still do if they wanted to do. But, you know, web browsing in particular, you know, I, the reason we called web browsing sensitive was because ISPs see every single thing you do, and people can talk about, oh, all these websites are encrypted now, but you can, number one, it's still a very small percentage, Number two, you can still learn an awful lot even when a website is encrypted, and that is unlike edge providers. And that is not to say, you will not hear me say 
that the edge providers shouldn't have some privacy rules applied to them as well. Okay, you know, I'm not one of those people who's going to say the ISPs should, you know, uh, be regulated one way and the edge providers should be regulated another way for privacy. However, that doesn't mean that when we have the opportunity to set the rules of the road for privacy for ISPs, that we shouldn't have the strongest possible rules to protect consumers. Well, is the reason that you didn't go that far when you were at the FCC because you didn't feel that the agency had that authority? Or oh, was there we definitely reason? did not have the authority to regulate ed edge providers. That's not, the FCC doesn't have the authority. And I actually found it somewhat ironic to hear uh, some of the minority commissioners, you know, talk about, how, basically invite us to do so. You know, we regulate communications, we regulate, I used to, regulate communications networks. I really got, it's only been three weeks. So the FCC regulates networks. It does not regulate the edge. Uh, it has obviously some content regulation when it comes to indecent programming, which I don't particularly care for very much. And people might have noticed we didn't use very much either. We didn't do a lot of enforcement in that area. But networks are where our, our jurisdictional sweet spot. And I, it did surprise me when people said, well, you could use your 706 authority to regulate the edge. I think we'd get thrown out on our behinds in court if we tried to do that. And I also don't think it doesn't go to our expertise and it's not good policy. Dr. Right. Jameson, yeah, go ahead. You yeah, I, I think as I'm listening to us here, we actually have a fair amount of agreement on this, that it'd be really good to have uniformity, that this, this actually be coherent in how this is done. Um, whether it should be up or down is then the debate to have, but it should be coherent. Can you expand on that a little bit in terms of what that looks like? Well, what maybe I wasn't very clear. In terms of do you have greater privacy prote protections or fewer privacy protections, that's a debate to have once you are able to say we can be coherent in how we do this. Because you can, ha if you try to, to say we're going to have one set of standards for an internet service provider and a different set of standards for the, the edge providers, the lines between those are actually a little fuzzy. And, and so the, the ecosystem itself doesn't function very well. I'd like to keep those close together and actually make them as much the same as we possibly could and then talk about do we need more or less. But online, do you think that the FCC has any regulatory authority in terms of regulating even networks? Uh, this, this is the economist speaking instead of the lawyer. My understanding is that, yes, the, as long as, as ISPs are Title II, that's the FCC's job. And if and Section 222 II? requires us to set rules to protect consumers when it comes to access to telecommunications services. To the extent that broadband remains a telecommunications service, we have authority under Section 222. And we, in fact, we must. We have a mandate. And the Federal Trade Commission loses authority at that point as well, right? right. So yeah, it's, it's That's why a I favor repeal it. of the common carrier exemption. And I do think, Markham's made this point several times, which is critically important, is the, the FCC and the FTC work really well together. And there's no reason why that can't continue in the future. But the notion that you might have, you know, one industry regulated by several different regulators is not a strange thing in American law. I mean, the banking industry has 11 different regulators. Now, that may be too much, but, you know, the aviation industry, that's why I started out as an aviation lawyer, has, you know, three or four different regulators. When, you know, a portion of the economy is so critically important to people, as this one is, it's not an odd notion, and in fact, I think it's prudent and necessary to have more than one regulator. But it's not, it's not one industry, multiple regulators. It's different parts of the same industry, different regulators for the same topic. In this case, we're talking about privacy. So I, I think that's different, and you may still think it's a good idea, yeah, but I, I don't. I do. <laughs> All right, well, on that I note, let's you didn't either. <laughs> I'm shocked. Let's go to spectrum <laughs> policy. So um, we've got the incentive auctions that are kind of approaching the end zone here. Um, Larry, what do you think the lessons are that we'll have learned from, from this experiment? Sure. So I, I think, you know, generally, I, I think we're going to say that the incentive auction was a success. It may not have been as fantastical a success as, uh, as AWS 3 was, but it, it, it looks like it's going to be quite successful. We'll get somewhere, you know, close to 100 megahertz of, of spectrum ultimately repurposed from broadcast to, uh, to, to mobile services. That's great. Um, and, uh, you know, and lots of money for the treasury, all that is good. 
I think, you know, in retrospect, some of the things we may learn is, well, one, you know, took a long time. It was, of course, the first time we've ever done something like this. But the longer things take, the more opportunity there are for mischief. Uh, and I think the complexity of it, which some of it was unavoidable, may have meant uh, some broadcasters, you know, were confused or some uh, carriers. It just, we may not have gotten, the next time around, it might be, I think, easier uh, to do. But I, I think the bigger lesson is, aside from all that, is um, auctions are hard. Auctions take a long time. Repurposing takes a long time. Clearly, um, the, the better solution, to the extent we could do it going forward, is to make as much as we can future licenses, whether it's for unlicensed use or, or license use, uh, to be as flexible as possible. And that way, the secondary markets can be much more effective at repurposing and reallocating spectrum when one use becomes obsolete or, or technically un unnecessary anymore, and there's a better use for the, for the same spectrum. I don't, I don't, well, I'll see if anybody disagrees, but I'd like to see more of that. Um, we've avoided flexible use uh, up until recently, uh, I think because of very legitimate concerns about interference, but the technology to detect and avoid interference, both on the transmitter and the receiver side, has gotten much better. It's going to get much better going forward. And so the opportunity to use more and more flexible uh, licensing uh, will increase. And as a result, uh, instead of these complicated auctions, we may be able to do a lot more on the secondary market, and therefore get it done quicker and, and more effectively. Gigi, what do you think? I'm so glad to hear you say <laughs> it was a success, because I agree with you. I think it was a success. And, and you know, I think there were some boo birds because we didn't put a gazillion dollars into the treasury, but. Well, you know, AWS3, unfortunately, set right. such a. <laughs> right, it set such a high bar, right? It was $41 billion. I mean, and nobody expected that. I think we expected like 17 billion. But you have to think about the competing, you know, I think the, the, the moral of the story is having a two-sided auction with four different competing goals is really hard. And I think we did a really good job. So what are the four goals? More spectrum for mobile wireless, Money for public safety. We forgot about that because we raised that for AWS 3. Holding the broadcasters harmless and making some of them lots of money and then making tons of money for the treasury. Do we make tons of money for the treasury? I mean, I'll take the 10 million say, bucks. Yeah. What do you mean I'm by not going to uh, complain, but you know, expectations were set so high from the AWS 3 that I think you know, some people were disappointed that we're not putting that same kind of money. But when you, when you have those four competing goals, I think we did pretty darn well. The most important in my mind, getting the spectrum out to its highest and best use for, for mobile wireless as opposed to, you know, I'm not saying broadcasting isn't important, but it wasn't the most efficient use of spectrum. So I'm glad to hear you say that, Larry. That makes me happy. <laughs> but do you expect it to be a model that's reproduced again in this country or elsewhere, or do you think it's going to be, as Larry suggested, more of this? Well, not in this kind. I mean, we're done, right? right. Uh, you know, we're not having any more broadcast spectrum incentive auctions, not that I could foresee. But yeah, I could definitely, uh, other countries were watching us very, very closely. And it would be nice to see them, you know, do the same, replicate it. So yeah, I, th I think we will see it around the world. Marco Markham? Um, I agree with, with both Larry and Gigi. The economists that work on spectrum at the FCC and with the FCC are world class. And everybody has been watching. I teach regulators around the world how do you do telecommunications regulation. We've talked a lot about this. And they all understand, once, once we walk away from it, that getting an auction right is really hard. The FCC took a big risk here. This could have been a dismal failure and quite embarrassing. But they've pulled it off. And it's kudos to the FCC for it. I, I agree with everything that's been said here. I think uh, it, it was very successful. And I think. Uh, it's nice to see, I also think, that the, the ecosystem and stakeholders have really coalesced around the need for more spectrum, both licensed and unlicensed. And uh, it, it could have been much more uh, contentious than it, it ended up being. So what do you guys see as the challenges that the industry and consumers are facing in, in bringing even more spectrum into the pipeline now? We need more spectrum. Um, and, and the low-hanging fruit is, is gone. The, 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 you know, the frontier is closed. Um, it's all about reallocation. And we all know we're the most attractive place to look for underutilized uh, or even unused spectrum is. It's the federal government itself. Um, in particular, a couple of agencies um, that, that have a lot of spectrum that they either aren't using much or that they're using for very specialized uses that uh, could easily be 
shared with, with uh, commercial uses as well. So that's clearly, from my standpoint, the, the opportunity for the next administration is to find ways and, and, and you know, really take seriously the idea of incentivizing the agencies that have the spectrum to give it up, just as we did with the, with the broadcasters. Uh, uh, you know, we can't just clearly, you know, the, the, the embedded civil service is much smarter than anybody else, and just saying to them, give it up, that doesn't work. So, <laughs> like any other economic issue, you need to provide incentives. Uh, and, uh, and that may be distasteful uh, on sort of in principle, it's, you know, it's, it's a government's spectrum, why can't they reallocate it the way they want? But um, I, I think that's the way to go, and I think that that would be the, the best source of really important and valuable spectrum that, 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 that could certainly be put to better use. I mean, give it up would be ideal, we'll take sharing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, if you want to take baby steps, but I agree with Larry 100% is to try to, you know, incentivize some of these agencies, uh, DOT, uh, to, you know. Is that T or D? DOT. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're never going to get the spectrum from DOD, but, you know, we, we've had a debate now for the last several years about how, you know, DOT has a bunch of spectrum, 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, that, you know, we've been trying to wrest out of their hands and or at least get them to share. Uh, you know, and they, and they insist they need it for, you know, car safety, but, you know, everything points to the fact that they're, they're barely doing anything with it. So at least we're trying to get them to share it, uh, if not give it up. So we'll take baby steps at this point, but Larry's absolutely right. The next frontier is the federal government. You wouldn't believe some of the government agencies that have large swaths of spectrum. Uh, and we need to identify it and we need to go after it in a way that, you know, refills the pot of spectrum. And, and I know this really takes leadership from the White House and NTIA to really push this because the agencies left to their own um, means or objectives, they just aren't incentivized on their own to think of this creatively or proactively. Um, they don't have the incentives to do it and you really need to push it from a central place like the White House. And, I think the, you know, the really good news is there is a lot of spectrum out there that's fallow, underutilized, and a lot of spectrum can be used that doesn't have to be always on for commercial activities, uh, that, that you don't need even a lot of robust spectrum, but as the Internet of Things uh, is really coming into place where things, if you think about things like your gas meter or uh, you know, machines that have to communicate at some point to another place about they need to be refilled with you know, soda cans and other things. And, you know, this is spectrum that uh, can be used and shared with others, and they don't need to be on a certain day at a certain time or even all the time. They can be implemented, you know, and, and actually take a second back seat to when the federal government needs it, and it would be a great use of that spectrum. So I think it's a really a great area for a lot of creativity, and, um, and that, but it, it, needs, it needs someone in the White House really pushing it. And the, by the way, I should say the, the incentives don't have to simply be giving them money. I mean, a lot of the... The uses that we see as inefficient are, for example, analog video surveillance technology that would be much more efficient if it was moved to digital and would use less spectrum and use less valuable spectrum. And you can imagine, in a perfect world, the users who want that spectrum would just pay the agencies to move from analog to digital. Everybody would be happy, but of course we have a lot of obstacles to that kind of transaction. And that, that's where I think the creativity becomes key. Back in the early 1990s, when we were first using auctions, we had a situation where some of the businesses purchased spectrum licenses in space that was already being used by local and municipal governments. And there was a lot of negotiations. How do we help you economic, how do we help the government economically move to a different space and do things differently and do things better? And people did work it out. But it had to be done at the, the local level because it's all situational. What do you expect the relationship to be between the FCC and the NTIA going forward in the new, in the new administration? I, I, I've actually not thought about that, haven't uh, addressed it at all. I'm not sure. It, it varies a lot from administration to administration. It just depends. Will the White House see NTIA as a, a strong voice for communications policy or not? In my experience, I've worked in this now for 30-some years. That varies a lot, and I don't know what will happen this time. I mean, the NTI has very limited authority, and I, I think we have to give credit to, to the Obama White House. They really tried. Um, you know, several executive orders, leadership from the top, everything we've said is important to getting the agencies to, to move, and, you know, they didn't move. So uh, does the NTI have the authority 
to, to push them harder? Probably not. Does the you know, president just saying so? Is that enough? No, we need the other incentives as well. Um, we tried it. It didn't work. And, and, and it's not going to work. In the, well, actually, we have a new I mean, president. I think Markham is, Markham is right. I mean, if you have somebody at the White House high up who really cares a lot, that could empower well, we did. NTIA. Yeah. But yeah. don't you think we did in the last eight years? You could have cared more. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm thinking about the first intellectual property enforcement coordinator, Victoria Espinel, who I didn't agree with much, but I like very much personally. She had Vice President Biden had her back, and she was able to do an awful lot and had quite a bit of power. So we did, but maybe not enough. Okay. Do any of you see anyone in this new administration who may be looking at these issues that you've discussed here? You mean who's already in the administration? Yeah. No. It's not been, as you look at what the I'm campaign said and what the president has, has said back when he was president-elect, you know, there's not a lot of discussion of this. There's some talented people at the FCC that will play a significant role, I'll think. But most of those appointments, you know, haven't been announced, haven't been yeah. made. It's too early to um, tell. We had, obviously, a very, I would say, de very detailed, we had a detailed uh, tech agenda from Secretary Clinton uh, and, you know, not necessarily people named to the post, but we kind of knew who the players were. You could talk about that in that context, but in terms of, of this administration, there was no, there was no written tech policy, uh, very little said about it, certainly on, on the campaign and since. I don't, by the way, I think that's a good thing from the standpoint, again, of Silicon Valley. We, we like to be ignored as much as possible, and if that continues for the next four years, that would probably be the best solution rather than getting help that you know, comes with strings attached. But no, so far we don't, we don't know the players, we don't know the policies. That's what makes this such an exciting time. <laughs> Speaking of something else that the administration hasn't really addressed yet, um, the Trump administration has promised to put out, uh, put forward a major infrastructure package, but they haven't spoken to whether or not broadband will be included. Um, from you all, how do you actually envision broadband being a part of an infrastructure package? Go well, I, you know, I predict broadband will be part of the infrastructure package. I think broadband has risen to that place where when people think about critical infrastructure, they're thinking about uh, broadband as, as just like they do with, with highways, roads, and other things. Um, I mean, I think, it, I think about this in two ways. One is, what can the administration do to try to incent more private investment in infrastructure development? And I said earlier that the marketplace for broadband internet access is broken. It's very tough to decide to invest in this space. One of the reasons is that uh, today the value of broadband is not as great unless you can get low cost video programming. Only about 7.9% of consumers uh, have cut the cord. So consumers want video programming with their broadband. So you have to be able to get to scale to be able to purchase video programming at the kind of costs that would incentivize you to compete with a major ISP. Unless you can do that, the value proposition isn't there. So there may be creative ways to address that through co-ops and other things that create market incentives to, to, to incentivize that. I think secondly, you have to have open internet rules that, that, that elevate the economic value of broadband. Uh, and without that, there's a natural incentive from those that provide the video programming to devalue the broadband side of their offering to slow down and prevent a competitor from coming in, uh, sort of a, a market, um, uh, protection, monopoly protection, maintenance type of argument. Uh, robust spectrum policies are there. And then, and then in terms of what the federal government can do, you know, figuring out how to provide either through tax incentives or through, uh, through uh, appropriations, especially in rural areas. There's just not the business case for the kind of broadband we want to see in rural locations. And there has to be some sort of mechanism to make it uh, attractive for an entity to build out to those rural places. And you know, if, if you know, Eisenhower believed that the highways were the way to unite rural places into the modern economy, broadband certainly is one of those ways to do that. And it doesn't have to be like the highway program, but you have to have the same, I think, intent to treat broadband like highways in terms of getting it out to univer universally to those rural places. But it's interesting, you know, when I was at the FCC, I had a number of carriers say to me that they didn't want to take half money. Connect America fund money, but they felt compelled because they thought it was politically dangerous. So even when there's money available, 
You know, we're not seeing, you know, we're seeing incumbents say, in fact, Verizon said, no, thank you. I don't, I don't want it anymore. So there needs to be something else. I don't know what the answer is, to be honest with you. I will tell you one answer. It would be nice if local communities could partner with, uh, with commercial ISPs and build their own networks. That would be nice. You know, half the states can't do that, and Virginia's just introduced a bill. I think that would be extraordinarily helpful. Communities where people, will, where incumbents will not build, okay, want to build their own networks or they want to partner, and that's public-private partnerships is really where it's going. Like municipal, municipalities building their own networks, that's not happening so much anymore. But it's more of these public-private partnerships. But the legislation, these state laws, that put barriers in front of that happening apply to public-private partnerships as well. I think that would be extraordinarily helpful. And I think you've got to deal with poll attachment barriers. You've got more dig once policies would be helpful. Um, you know, shot clocks and other requirements for communities to move more quickly. Again, working with the local communities. I'm not sure, you know, I think some are in favor of just preempting them and just putting their foot down. But I think it's got to be more of a conversation and less of a, you know, you do this, you do that, particularly as we go to 5G and we're talking about not a handful of antennas, but we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of antennas. You know, you can't get in a battle with the local community because it's not going to be a very, very pretty site. So, but to me, the whole future of universal service in rural and particularly in tribal areas. So I went and testified in front of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee and I said, 41% of tribal areas don't have broadband and they practically laughed me off the, you know, off the table. I mean, how do you fix that? Uh, you know, I just don't know. Uh, I think you have to get the tribal governments more engaged, more invested, again, in building their own networks with the help of the private sector, but there's no easy answers to filling that deployment gap. I think it's like 10% of Americans still have no broadband, but it's 39% in rural areas, and like I said, 41% and probably a lot higher in tribal areas. It's a, it's a real sticky wicket. I don't expect that the infrastructure plan that the president ultimately comes out with is going to be able to solve those problems. And I don't, well, we don't know anything about it. All, all actually was said about the plan was that it would be debt financed rather than, than tax financed, direct tax financed. That's it. I mean, that's, that's really all the, the details we have. I mean, I would hope for the, for, so I, I, I want universal broadband uh, adoption. Um, I think from the network effect standpoint, that's very important. But if I compare the infrastructure, the rest of the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the water systems, the, the, the pipeline, the grid, electrical grid, uh, one is decaying very fast, the other is improving, maybe not at the speeds we all would like, but it's improving. And if I'm going to you know, have to make decisions, I would rather that the actual direct expenditures go to the physical infrastructure that's, that's in such bad shape. But I agree with, with, with Markham that you know, what we really need to do is in, incent private investment. I think one thing, and, and this gets back to your earlier point about intermodal competition as well, we have now, or very much on the horizon, uh, we have intermodal technologies that either are or will, I think, in a reasonable amount of time, uh, be comparable in terms of, of speed and performance to wired service. Um, so things like fixed wireless, even satellite, uh, obviously what, what 5G will bring. And, you know, we have, some, we have some prejudices built into universal service against uh, some of those technologies uh, because it was assumed that they, were not provide, they would not provide adequate speeds and so on. But obviously in rural areas and sparse population, uh, we are not going to be laying fiber, you know, under any incentive system uh, in the immediate future. So I think uh, promoting those alternative technologies and making sure that, in fact, they can uh, have lower costs of entry, be true intermodal competitors, uh, would go a great way uh, to incentivizing private investment, and that's really, as I think you both said, that's really the way to and, solve and it. And one easy thing is, is if those other projects are priorities, the building the roads and the bridges, it's very easy to attach to that, this sure. dig once. It's and a yeah. dig once, I mean, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. So that should be a no-brainer and low-hanging fruit, I would hope. Yeah. And, and that kind of thing, I think, makes sense. I, I'm cautious about drawing an equivalence between mm -hmm. broadband and, and roads and bridges and, and water systems and such, because those are natural monopolies, you're only going to have one road or you're going to have one water system. Broadband is not that way. 
and, and thinking about, well, gee, we will have some sort of, of federal funding for that gives you a very different dynamic than when you're building roads and bridges. Um, I do think it's important, as has been talked about, of, of taking away as many of those barriers to that investment as we can. I just want to be very cautious about saying we're going to have a way like we had with the Department of Commerce or the Department of Agriculture providing funding because that did not work very well. And it's, it's very predictable that it would not have worked very well. So we have a, a few more questions, but we wanted to start uh, an opportunity for questions from the audience. Does anyone? Uh, let's see. I think there's some microphones going around. Go ahead. Uh, why don't you start with this table here? Hi, Eric Berger, Georgetown University. Hi, Larry. Uh, so I got a question. There are like two questions, and they might not sound it, but they're actually related. One was a couple of years ago, I was past chair of the IEEE USA Committee on Communications Policy. And one thing that was before us was the legislation that would give the commissioners a fifth slot that was to be filled by an engineer. And I thought, wow, that sounds really cool. But then I had three past chief technologists and one CTO of the FCC who said, no, 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 no. You, you can't support it because what will happen is they'll hire someone who had like a bachelor's degree in enge engineering and a lawyer. Uh, and that kind of <laughs> ties me, into you know, the cultural <laughs> thing is, you know, if you looked at the privacy NPRM, a lot of the questions started with, well, we know this will be duplicative with the FCC, FTC and we'll end up with something different. Do you think, do you agree that that'll confuse things? And it just kept going over and over and it was kind of like, you know, you kind of have the answer in the question. So I wanted to hear. Is there a question there? Yeah, yeah the, question the question there is, is, is there, yeah, you know, is this idea of like, yeah, we all want more engineers there, but is that really realistic with the organization as it is today? I, I said it's up to Congress. <clears throat> I wish they would give us more ability to get more engineers. It's only realistic if they pass a law, <clears throat> but there, it's certainly right. desirable. There are a lot of countries that do require particular backgrounds for their boards of directors, so that's what they may have instead of a commission or their commissions that they'll require some to be business people, some to be economists, some to be engineers, and, and such as that. Part of, of what makes that, well, one thing that does not do is add that technical expertise to the agency. That really is the role of the staff. And so that's why when I was writing, I focused on, on the structure and, and composition of the staff. What it, it does do, and I'm not sure if it do it in a five-person commission, it gives the person a different kind of loyalty. You know, who do they think of themselves as? If I'm a professional economist, I think about, you know, what do my other academic economists think about what I'm saying? I talk in that, that context. And so what we see in a lot of these other countries is those are actually part-time positions. So it's not a full-time commissioner that's also an engineer. It's someone that is a professional engineer. It's someone who is a professional economist, someone who is a business person. Part-time, they're making regulatory decisions. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but uh, speaking of the notion of what Congress can do for the telecommunication space, we have Senator Thune with us in the back. Uh, so I think we're going to transition to uh, him next. Thank you all for being on the panel. Thank you.